Well, good morning on our last morning of Ed Media 2015. Um, I, I must say, I've first time been to Montreal and uh, certainly a fantastic city. I'm uh, very happy to be a Canadian after being here for sure. Um, welcome to uh, the final keynote of Ed Media 2015. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce a colleague, Dr. John Drawn, uh, this morning for the final keynote. John is originally from the UK and currently works with Athabasca University in the School of Computing and Information Systems. John's an active publisher contributing thought-provoking articles and books in our field of educational technology and distance education. In 2005, John was awarded the British National Teaching Fellowship. His first book is titled Control and Constraint in E-Learning, Choosing When to Choose. And his most recent book with co-author Dr. Terry Anderson is titled Teaching Crowds, Learning with Social Media, published by Athab Athabasca University Press. John's an avid sailor, musician, and writer who's an inspiration to many of us in the field of distance and online learning. Please help me welcome Dr. John Drawn. Why, thank you, Nathaniel. How charming of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and how charming of you all to turn up today. Thank you very much for, for, for doing so on this last day when you could be out enjoying the holiday time in, uh, in wonderful, wonderful Montreal. Let me see if this works. Not at all. But close enough, close enough. Uh, let's start at the beginning. I always find the beginning is a good place to start. But uh, I don't know, we live in a sort of hypermedia world, so, so why bother with, with, with beginnings when we could get straight to the end? Uh, I'm going to talk today about teaching crowds, um, which is at least that's, that, that, that's, that's the obvious part of the text. There's also a subtext, and the subtext is, is really sort of uh, changing education a little bit, maybe a lot. And I'm hoping that some of you at least will be able to join me and others in the, the conversation afterwards when we can talk about ways in which we might incrementally do this. But I'm going to go for the jugular, and I'm going to try and uh, think about how we might actually change education properly. Um, Teaching Crowds is a book that's downloadable for free. The URL will be available at the end, or you could go to teachingcrowds.ca to, to get a free copy, because I don't believe in, in charging you for such things. But if you want to buy it, you can. Um, and I think I get a dollar for every copy that you buy, so well worth it. Huh. This is... Uh, what John Chambers said in 1999, and he was mocked, mercilessly mocked. This was just before uh, the dot-com the dot crash, after the dot-com boom, and, and, and everyone thought that's, that's entirely ridiculous. E-learning, a rounding error. Did you get that sense? I don't know. You want to learn something? What do you do? Tell the person next to you. What do you do? Well, first, you want to, there's something you want to learn. It could be anything. It could be you want to find out somebody's name. You want to tell somebody. <laughs> this is like listen, li li listening to a bubbling noise, because what I'm hearing is Google, 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 Google. And I think that's, uh, that's fairly reasonable. Uh, is this going to play some music for us? Yes. Come along with me to the beach at Waikiki. I just have to Take play this song because it's cute. Just this is the Mai Tai Gents. Wiki 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 Wikipedia, of course, is the other answer that I tend to hear. Um, if I want to learn something, I tend to, to go to one of these things. I, I, I often go to, uh, I, I'm a geek type programmer, so I often go to, to Stack Overflow. Um, where I can get answers to questions and problems that I have with pretty much any kind of programming language or problem that I've got. Um, I often go to YouTube. I, I, I've taken it upon myself to teach myself a musical instrument every year. Uh, and the first thing I do after getting the musical instrument is uh, Google, but go to YouTube, watch people playing it, watch people giving me tutorials and stuff. Uh, I get an awful lot of stuff from Twitter. Anybody here get stuff from Twitter? Yeah, it's a thing. 
It's a thing. There's so much that passes through, that serendipitous stuff that happens. Uh, email, of course, it, it, you know, every email message is an opportunity for learning. Every, uh, 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 on your Facebook book wall, I hate Facebook, I keep off it, uh, but I study it, I'm interested in what it does. Uh, evil place, but it, it's, a, it's a place where an enormous amount of learning happens. Even uh, texts on your phone. Every, every time we communicate with somebody else, and when somebody else communicates with us, and of course in the read-write world, we are uh, doing this all the time, it's a learning opportunity. All of these things are driven by cloud, uh, crowds. Google search, as we shall see later, is very much driven by people, by, by a crowd of people, not by one person deciding this is what you're going to learn, but by a lot of people. And this I find to be quite interesting because people do really very wonderful things. Um, they inspire us. They, they model behaviors. They give us different perspectives on things. They, they, uh, they, there's great value in engaging with people, a uh, teachback. Gordon Pask talked about teachback, this, this, this um, positive feedback loop where um, in simple form, uh, we learn best by teaching others. And we're doing it all the time. Every time we tell somebody something, every time we share something that we found with somebody, we are helping one another to learn to do with, 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 with forming our own identities. Our own identities are only possible because of other people, about sharing, caring, validation, all wonderful things. These things actually sort of start to look quite familiar to me. Um, but there's something weird going on in education, as you've probably noticed, <laughs> because we're, we're still following this model. If uh, Abelard, one of the uh, early educators in universities, um, had come into a modern classroom, or even to a modern learning management system, I think he would have recognized the methods of learning and teaching that we have. Oh dear, my connection is lost. So I will stand here. I hate standing here. It's, it's really a separation, isn't it? Strange how it separates you from the crowd. Anyway, anybody got a device on them? Because uh, we I, uh, got a little thing that I would like to ask you to do. Because I'm wondering why, given that there are all these wonderful crowds around us, <laughs> and also wondering why my, uh, my device doesn't, doesn't do what it's supposed to do, I'd like your thoughts on why we bother having teachers. You know, there's a lot of us. We're, we're all teaching one another. There's a mass of stuff. We're swimming in a sea of teachers. Why do we have actual teachers? Now, if you go to that, that uh, URL, http colon slash slash padlet.com slash jondron slash teachers. Or if you, can, uh, if you can make use of that 2D code, it might actually work, I don't know. And start entering some ideas, any ideas that you've got on this one. I'm going to, um, I'm going to see what you're, what you're writing by going to click on something. There it is. Let's see what's actually going on here. Lovely. I'm getting a general sense that some people have started to type things. They teach. <laughs> da. Thank you. Uh, let's make this a little bit bigger. So what are teachers doing? They're inspiring. They're encouraging. I think I see, oh, prevent learning. <laughs> yes, we do. We prevent learning sometimes. Uh, we talk a lot. OK, coach. Coach sounds to me a little bit like teach. Tell, they tell you where to start. That's an important one. It's often we're kind of lost. We, 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 it, it's all very well having all of these choices, but very, very um, difficult to know how to make those choices unless we're empowered to make them, unless we know what we need to make. So I think that telling you where to start is a good one. Eliciting and challenging conceptions and misconceptions. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Following and enforcing rules. Somebody after my own heart here. Yes, we tend to do that. Help provide stickability. Care, big one. We, they care, they love. I like the word, I like the word love. It's a, it's, a, it's a good one, I think, for what teachers do. There's a, a lovely term of pedagogical love, which I, I think is quite a, a nice way of thinking about it, you know, that it's about 
caring about learning and caring about how they learn and all of those things, inspiring speaking, and so this is good. I think that's, uh, uh, you can carry on entering things here and you can, you can revisit it later if, uh, if, if you feel inclined. Uh, I'm gonna make that one small now and hopefully I will return to the presentation momentarily. Okay, so uh, in case nobody came up with anything, I came up with a whole bunch of, uh, of, of possibilities. Um, and I think those things like sort of uh, managing the learning process, organizing it, finding stuff for people, telling people about things, filtering things I think is important, guiding and showing, these, these, the, the, these are the sort of uh, the stuff of teaching. But really the, the, the big stuff is probably about the caring, the connecting, problematizing, challenging, inspiring. And model, modeling behavior, I think this is a very big one. But these are things which are very similar to the kinds of things that people are doing for one another. It's what we're doing now. What is it that's special about a teacher? And why do we actually even bother to have a teacher? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand what we mean by teacher. It's a moment. <laughs> if I'd done this right, I would have made that the lone teacher. We have this notion that learning is done through teaching, that what we teach is what people learn, that what we teach is how people learn. And this is, this is I think, sort of probably funda fundamentally at least up for challenge. How many teachers do you see in this picture? Again, tell the person next to you. Describe the, the, the teachers in that picture to the person next to you. Teachers, you see, I'm giving this away. I mean, obviously, I think there's more than one teacher here. But who do you see? What do you see? What are the teachers? And we've got a bunch of kids sitting at desks looking at a teacher in a classroom. <laughs> I think, I think there's really quite a lot. And I don't think I've got enough arrows to point to all of the teachers in this classroom. The teacher obviously is a teacher. The children obviously are teachers. That seems to me just plain blatant and obvious. But there are other teachers in this classroom. There are books, huge teachers. And those, those books are hiding a wealth of other teachers, editors, designers, um, uh, subject experts, whatever, the people who wrote the, t uh, the textbooks. The pen, the pen teaches us. We, it, it, it shapes our thought. The way we write shapes our thought. There are pictures on the wall that are teaching us. There's a door that is teaching us. It is teaching us that what's happening in this classroom is different from what's happening outside that classroom. It's creating a, a space inside which this, this process of learning is happening. And it, it's very not neutral. It's um, the fact that we're saying, in here you will do learning, out there you'll do playing, is a terribly, terribly important distinction. The desks teach, especially their position, the way in which they're positioned in, in relationship to one another and to the teacher. Uh, I, 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 I was wondering whether the teacher's shoes teach. I think they do. They say something about, if she, I mean, if she were wearing um, bright red stiletto heels or sneakers, it would be a different experience. So teachers, teachers are absolutely everywhere. It's distributed teaching, always. There's never one teacher, and, and students never learn, learn alone. Timetables teach. Gosh, do timetables teach. I, um, when I was a kid, I had a math class. It, it was two years. And uh, for one year, the teacher was away. The teacher was sick. And basically, we just had a bunch of people that came and sat at the front of the class to make sure we were there. But what we had was a timetable. What we had was one another. And what we had was a textbook. We had a whole load of teachers. Now, interestingly, that particular class got nearly three times as many grade A's as had ever been achieved in the 50-year history of the school. Now, the, the, there was no physical teacher there, but there was such a lot of teaching presence. And timetables, timetables have, have, have quite a large effect. 
So we're swimming in the sea of teachers. But for some reason, we stick a teacher in front and do what I'm doing now. Now, why? I've been intrigued by this. I've been intrigued by how it all started. How do we get into this very strange situation that we're in now? Because actually, it's totally bizarre when you start to think about it, given the kinds of communication possibilities that we've got now, the kinds of technologies and tools, the ways in which we can communicate with one another. Why is it that we're still doing the same stuff that we did in, did in medieval times? Well, I think it's down to one and only one thing. That it's basically, I mean, we want to sort of transfer cultural knowledge. That's what, what we do as, as, as human beings. We want to sort of pass on our knowledge. And once we get past a certain size in society, it, it, you can't just do that inside families. There's too much of it, it and, and things start to need to be codified and whatever. So we have people that kind of know this stuff. Let's call them teachers. And there's a limit to how far a, a teacher's voice will carry. Um, but it seems like a fairly logical thing that when you've got one person that has a lot of knowledge and a lot of people that don't have much, then, you know, use the technologies that are available. And the technologi technologies that were available up until mostly the advent of print um, were um, text and speech. Now, speech was a particularly important one because books tended to be very, very expensive. The, the word lecturer comes from uh, to read. A lecturer reads out the text. It's an, an efficient way of getting a lot of knowledge, kind of, not terribly, I mean, it's not terribly effective as we know, but, but you get a bunch of knowledge from one person's head into another. So it, it's, it sort of makes sense. But as a result of that, you wind up with pretty much everything else. Because if you've got uh, if, if you want to have one person sharing knowledge with a lot of other people, you've got to have a timetable. You've got to have a time when everybody's there. And you've got to have, um, some, well, it's a good idea to have some kind of room to do it in because you want a shelter from the rain. You want to avoid the distractions of sitting in the, in the, the village square or, or wherever, although at universities originally, that's what they did. And out of that, you start to get um, a sort of mechanization of this process. You, you, you start to have things like courses being developed. You, they have, there's a body of knowledge, and that body of knowledge sort of leads to things like learning outcomes. There are things that people sort of have to know. And as part of the learning process, inevitably you're going to wind up giving feedback, and once you're giving feedback, well, why not start crediting people with saying, well, this person is now an expert and they can teach. They can become a doctor or a master or whatever it happens to be. We wind up with things as we start to get more books and things available, then we have things like libraries. Uh, we get the invention of desks. We get the invention of institutions, which are designed to pull these things together. The early universities uh, were a result of uh, the cities really wanted students. Students were brilliant. They came in with all, lots and lots of money, and they spent it. So cities were very keen to, keep their, to have their universities there. Uh, and they try to attract scholars. And once you sort of get a gaggle of scholars together, well, why not form an institution? We get faculties, we get schools, we get rules and regulations, because once you've got these sorts of things happening, then you need to start taking control. You need hierarchies of management. We get things like semesters, um, because there are religious holidays when everybody's away, and you can't teach somebody when everybody is away, so obviously you need to get uh, uh, have some, some kind of term, and if you've got a term, well, why not stick a, make a course that length? You know, why not make it every course, I don't know, 13 weeks, 12 weeks, 10 weeks, whatever it happens to be. This, I hope that you're noticing, has absolutely nothing to do with learning. This is simply the almost inevitable effect of finding a fairly efficient way to get one person's knowledge to a lot of people in a physical space. But really, most importantly, the big thing that follows from it is that you get people that don't want to be there. This is the weirdest thing that education has done to us. If what you're going to do is to follow a course, a, a, a pattern of teaching, um, and, and be telling people things typically, but whatever, I mean, whatever activities, make them nice activities, make them friendly ones, make them stuff where they're doing stuff and building stuff. 
there are going to be people that are just not interested, or people that find it just too difficult, uh, too boring, and maybe they've just got something else to do. But by definition, we're putting people, when we do this, into a context that is, by definition, demotivating. Now, I'm going to draw on self-determination theory here. Uh, Ryan and I never know how to pronounce Daisy. Is it Daisy or Decky? Anybody know? Let's say Daisy for no particular reason. This is uh, self-determination uh, posits that there, and this is a terribly well-validated theory, uh, posits that there, are, that there are three essential factors that underpin intrinsic motivation um, in people generally. Um, they, they need to uh, experience a sense of competence or challenge, uh, but, but not too much challenge, not too little. They need a sense of relatedness with others. They need to be connected with others. It needs to have some relevance and meaning to, to in, in, social, in their social lives, one way or another. And really big one, they need control. They need to be, have autonomy. They need to feel that they're in control, to be more precise. And that's the one thing that doesn't happen when you're doing this one-to-many style of teaching. When you're putting people inside a space for a fixed period of time, you're winding up with a set of constraints that are intrinsically demotivating. So what we wind up doing is inventing pedagogies. See, I think pedagogies are just technology. And when I say pedagogies, I don't mean pedagogy. I mean pedagogies, methods of teaching, ways of teaching, learning designs, techniques, uh, uh, idea, uh, theories, methods. But what we, when you've got a bunch of constraints that are, you lock people in a space, metaphorically or literally in, in some cases, uh, and you've got them there for a fixed period of time with your, their full and undivided attention, or at least you want them to, uh, to give you their full and undivided attention, then you've got to do something. You've got to come up with a way of teaching. And so all of our pedagogies, all, nearly all of our pedagogies, many of the pedagogies that have been developed and that have been researched over the last hundreds of years, have been based on the assumption that there's a whole bunch of people locked into a classroom for a fixed period of time in which a teacher is in control. Now, even when we sort of generously give control to students, I th we're not really. I'm not, I, I've heard through in, in, in many of these things, people talking about, oh, these very liberating pedagogies and things, but they're all using words like, well, I make my students do this. I get my students to do this. Um, the, the students have to do that. That's, that's the language we use about these things. It's a weird language, but it's a language that's based on the assumption of being in a space in which you have control. And this, this, is, where, this is where things, things start to worry me. And, and, and uh, because I don't teach in that context anymore. This is, this is very weird to me. I, I, I'm fully online. I'm Athabasca University, fully online. So, None of these things are true for me, except that we carry on doing the same things. Now, what happens when you take away that power? Well, we've all seen diagrams like this. This is, this is uh, completion rates for a Coursera MOOC, an average Coursera MOOC. At the, uh, at the top, the large bar is the number of registered students. The bit that you can't see is those that completed. This is what happens when you're applying the pedagogies that are designed based on the assumption of control over everything that learners say and do. And it's a bit of a weird assumption even then when you start to think about it, because remember, there's all these distributed teachers. This, this, this weird assumption leads to these, uh, well, I mean, nobody's, nobody wants to complete it. That whole notion of a course is completely crazy. It only makes sense when you've got people locked in a classroom, when you've got a fixed period of time. There is no rational excuse for having it. Because e-learning gives us a whole bunch of, of really good things, really good freedoms. These, this is from our book. Um, uh, we're extending here Morton Polson's um, uh, hexagon of cooperative freedoms. He has got this theory of cooperative freedoms. These are the freedoms that are possible uh, when you're learning online. 
when you're a distance learner. And there are the obvious ones there, like place. You have free, you know, you can, you can learn anywhere, so you're not locked in this classroom anymore. The time, if, you're, if, it, if it's asynchronous, you can learn any, any time. The pace, you can learn at your own pace. It, and that can vary enormously. Athabasca, for example, we give our students six months, they can do whatever they like with that six months at their own pace. Some people make people do things over the course of a week. But again, there's freedoms, potential freedoms in, in, in pace. But they also have potential freedoms uh, in content, in method. Um, it, it, there's a lovely study by, by Margaret Hockey and, and um, uh, I've forgotten his first name, Muirhead, um, where they looked at what distance learners actually did. So we, we, these learning designers um, uh, made these beautiful designs. They said, do this, do this, and then do this, and then do this test, and then, and so on. Did the students do it? Of course not, because they had the freedom not to. But they still did it. And that's an interesting thing. That's, I mean, why is it that, that the students continue to do it I mean, we get 80% completion rates, which I think is not too bad for distance learning with learners who, who've got no, we've got no prerequisites, we're an open university. Um, I think that's, that's, got, that's got a lot to do with, with commitment. Uh, there, there's loss aversion. People, people, if, if people have invested something in, in a course, especially money, they don't really want to lose it. That's one of the reasons. Um, and they also, want, they also want our awards, and I'll get to that. There are other freedoms as well, which I think are, are kind of important. Uh, the, the freedom of relationships, whether you, whether you engage with other people. Uh, one that I think is particularly important that, that springs from my, my first book, Control and Constraint in E-Learning, uh, the freedom of delegation. The ability to choose when to choose. To say that, I have no idea what I'm doing. Tell me what to do. But also to say, stop telling me what to do. These are freedoms that you have as a human being that you typically give up when you come into a classroom. And yet, we are still teaching, following similar pedagogies to the ones that are used in classrooms when we're teaching online. This doesn't really make any sense. So um, let's, let's, uh, let's, th th there's my version of the Starship Enterprise. It was the only public domain version that I could find. Um, but uh, we will have a little bit of um, boldly going where no one's gone before. So what happens when we go beyond the classroom? What possibilities are there? And, 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 and how can we make use of this wealth of teachers that's around us? I think it's worth noting that the Starship Enterprise, not that loud. OK, Starship Enterprise, you can stop now. It's worth noting that they were boldly going where no one has gone before, but they were going together. And that whenever we're learning, we're boldly going where no one has ever gone before, because learning is always a step into something new. It's always a challenge. Social forms, social forms. So Terry Anderson and I have been working for the last few years on um, trying to understand how the landscape of social media, of read-write media, uh, change how people interact and how learning happens. And we've, we've got this, this um, taxonomy uh, where we, we treat the, wor uh, the world in terms of, of these three main forms, uh, the group, the network, and the set. Now, groups are what we're familiar with. Groups are the classes, groups are the seminar groups, those kinds of things, the tutorials, the teams, those sorts of stuff. Um, networks are just the people we know. That's, there's a bunch of people that we know. We learn from our friends. We learn from the people that we meet on the corner. We, we learn from one another here in the conference. Um, and sets of people that just happen to be in the same place with the same interest, and somehow or other, something they do helps people to learn. Uh, if I look outside now, one of the things I'll look outside for will be, are there people carrying umbrellas? They're helping me to learn whether it's raining. Simple example. These are not... Um, uh, the fixed categories that don't overlap. In fact, they, they, they blur into one another in all sorts of ways. And, and, and any particular kind of form may involve many of the others. For instance, every group is a network. It's also a, it's a network of people who are connected through the group. It's also a set of people that are taking a course, for example. Um, so so th these are, they're more like uh, colors in a palette. 
we get different blends in any kind of social gathering. Here, for example, I feel we have something of a set. This is a set of people who are interested uh, in educational media and related things. But there are also networks here. There are people that I know, people that I don't know, uh, people that I might get to know. And there are elements of the group here. There's a process involved uh, where we're all following a certain set of rules and norms because you're not interrupting me, which is funny, isn't it? Beyond that, there's also a thing that we've been looking at, which is what happens when a whole bunch of people work together and become um, a collective. And a collective isn't a social grouping. Oh, let's have, let's have the sound effect. We are the board. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. That's the meaning of collective that I have in mind. <laughs> But not in a bad way. <laughs> this, is, this is like friendly Borg. The reason uh, uh, that I started using the word collective was actually because um, I, I had built a, a, a computer system that allowed the crowd to help itself. And one of my students was using it, and he, and he reflected, oh, well, this is just like the Borg, isn't it? We're just kind of a collective mind. Um, and the idea was that the, this collective mind was acting as some kind of teacher. We can see this sort of thing happening all the, t uh, all the time, and we do it even in conventional classrooms. Uh, I, can, I can use collective intelligence now. Um, let's have a think. Uh, what is, yes, tell me, uh, uh, have, I got, uh, have I got 15 minutes left? Could uh, a show of hands for have I got 15 minutes left? Oh, no, have I got 20? Show of hands, oh dear. <laughs> the collective is telling me that I'm wrong about all of my, the, my timing. But uh, we, we learn things from crowds. Te I learn from the yawns. I, I, uh, teachers learn from the shows of hands, from, from the kinds of feedback that they get. It's, it's always been so. But we have many more opportunities to do that kind of thing on the internet. And I'm going to skip rather, rather rapidly through. Uh, 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 Cherry and I think that this is a process of evolution. Uh, that uh, distance learning, and we are talking distance here, has evolved from a behaviorist cognitivist pattern involving no social connection to speak of at all through the social constructivist times when uh, we're making use of online groups and learning management systems and discussion systems into this connectivist era, era where, where the network has become important, where the people we know without structure have become important, and possibly into a, 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 an emerging generation fueled by learning analytics of classic collective sort of application, um, where w the power of the large numbers becomes really important. But I, I shall talk quickly through. Traditional teaching is all about groups. And, and groups have very distinctive features. They have power relationships. There are sequences in groups. There are rights of joining and leaving in groups. Think of the traditional classroom. Think about how the students sign up, the ways in which they, they leave. Um, there are very much hierarchies. They tend to be paced. They te the groups tend to have a purpose. They, we are here to learn about X, for example. Um, and we, we, they typically happen over a period of time for reasons just mentioned. They nearly always have names, Comp 601 or whatever. Um, there are often structures involved with them. There are uh, ways in which they are formed and formulated, constitutions. This is, this is the way in which we've done groups in the past. And groups can be pretty good. Uh, they're pretty good for uh, pre planned learning. You know, if you, and if you want to make that efficient use of experts in, in a physical space, it's not too bad. You get support and process management so the teacher can control that process. And they're pretty good. If you, if you do them right, then you can build a trusting and caring community. Um, you, you, you can work through processes, and especially if you figure out ways to do them democratically, reduce hierarchies. You can support ownership and gain social capital. They're good things, groups, but, uh, oh, and we've got many tools to support them. This, these are our, our, our favorite learning management systems out there, Moodle, Blackboard, Canvas, desire to learn, all of those sorts of things, plus other kind of um, content management tools, Drupal, Joomla, uh, and tools built for discussion like discourse. These are, we, we built a lot of tools for these, and you'll recognize these because they all have roles in them. 
there's always uh, somebody who's a, a boss role, somebody who's maybe not such a boss role, and people who are just the normal plebeians. Um, and, and if you've used any learning management system, you'll know there's a, there'll be a teacher role, there might be a learning designer role. That's how you recognize them. Uh, but they, they, they have some major disadvantages. And the big one, the one in bold that I've already mentioned, is the fact that when you bunch of people do things together, some of those people are going to be doing things that they don't want to do at any given time. So we're going to have to come up with ways of encouraging them to do stuff. Now, how weird is that? There's nothing more natural in the world than to want to learn. We learn, I mean, that's, it, it, it's in our, it's completely, it is our nature. Learning is the most natural, wonderful thing in the world. Look at kids as they, they, they you know, their desire to explore, to discover, to feel, to touch, to, you know, it, it makes us smile. And yet, we have to make people do stuff. Now, that's weird. And that is part of the problem with a group process. When you design a process, a mechanism, to um, support that learning process, it's, um, it leads, it, it leads in inevitably to having to use some kinds of methods of extrinsic motivation. So we're making a, an uphill struggle for ourselves by using these things. They're also very inefficient, they're very expensive. Uh, if you want to do the kind of social stuff in groups, um, you can't really do it in large groups. It's, you know, a good number is about 15. I've seen it done reasonably well, up to about 50 people, maybe even 60. After that, it starts to get very tricky to get people to collaborate together, to work together. And that's collaboration is one of the real features of groups. It's that purposive move together towards something. But there are these other social forms, the network and the set. And networks, just the people you know, are how we get a vast amount of the knowledge that we have. Now, those of us who are on social media are very aware of this flow, this stream of things that we're learning from other people. But those people around us are telling us most of the things that actually matter. And when I say, not telling us, but they are co-constructing with us this knowledge that we have of the world around us. They're sharing ideas, we're talking with them, we're arguing with them, we're being inspired by them. All of those good things are happening with people that we know. And there are many tools, of course, that have been designed to exploit that. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Tumblr, all of these sorts of, all these sorts of guys. Particular attention there to Elg, which is an open source system that we use, and WordPress, another system that you can use to build systems for uh, supporting networks. And you'll recognize network systems because they don't have roles. Because these sorts of systems uh, are, are typically about building connections and about providing individual access control. So it's you that decides who gets to see what to do what, not a system administrator. And networks are great for lifelong learning, finding answers, they're for situated learning, for learning on the spot, for, way, for, for, for being in a place and discovering from other people how um, you know, the things that are going to be of value. They're, they're great for learner control. There's, there's no process that's saying, you must do this, you must do this. There's just a bunch of people, and you, you can ask, uh, I, I can ask Nathaniel and say, how, uh, Nathaniel, I want to buy a bison. Where can I get one from? And he'll actually tell me. Um, he knows. That's bizarre, isn't it? But you see, we know our, our knowledge is out there in our friends. Very scalable. You know, the larger your network is, the better, really. The more knowledge that you've got coming in, the more possibilities, the greater diversity you've got of friends, the better it's going to be. Um, but there are some problems. Notably, that lack of process can be a problem if you're, a, uh, if you're not entirely sure where to go next, and especially if you want to make plans. Um, those paths to learning can be very inefficient. If anyone's ever done a connectivist course, uh, I don't know, anybody done a connectivist course here? One or two. They're good fun, I would recommend them. They, you find them from time to time. Dave Cormier has just finished his rhizomatic learning, which is a very interesting one. No, no curriculum, no guidance, just a bunch of people talking with one another, learning from one another in massive amounts. You do tend to get problems with preferential attachment and the Matthew effect. The Matthew effect is the rich get rich, the poor gets poorer. Um, so the, the people who are doing well within a network tend to do better. And networks tend to, meet, uh, if, if you're not well connected, you'll tend to stay not well connected. 
Um, and the fact that you're connected might be more important than what you know. And that means that you don't necessarily get the best experts. There's a lack of structure. You've got problems with echo chambers. Uh, you tend to, uh, uh, networks of affiliation tend to be people that share your views. So you, you tend not to get so much challenge on networks. There's been a fair bit of interesting research on that. There was a Pew report just a little while ago that, that shows this seems to be fairly commonplace. Sets are good. Sets are just people that are occupying a, a single space. And for example, um, many of these out there on the web, essentially any kind of sort of public space where there are people interacting is typically going to have some set-like elements about it. Wikipedia is the big classic one. There's a whole bunch of people that are, are working together, that are sharing stuff, that are learning from one another, who don't know each other at all. In fact, among the, 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 the five among the top 50 Wikipedia contributors are known only by their IP address. This is not about knowing people. This is about just simply having an interest in a topic. Uh, Twitter hashtags, the ed, follow edmediaconf, and you're going to wind up uh, with just a set of stuff that has been shared by people from which you can learn. The, the, the Stack Exchange series of sites, uh, these are question and answer sites. Question and answer sites are great. You go there to find content, but what you actually find is content produced by people. People become the crowd that, that, that's actually teaching you. And that's pretty cool because you can find out a whole bunch of stuff. I, this is, YouTube is another good example. I, I mean, YouTube, you find stuff, you put in a search term. The search term is what matters. But the people are what's generating the content. And it's great for serendipity. It's great for finding answers. An anonymity can be a very good thing, especially if you want to talk about something which is a little bit scary, some disease that you want to learn about, for instance. Lots of support sites out there for people who are entirely anonymous. You recognize sets typically because they're anonymous or pseudonymous. Uh, people tend not to be recognized by name. Great deal of learner control. None of this, you must do this. You go somewhere because you're interested in being there. Coming to a lecture in a morning is one good way of, of, of doing that. You get diverse perspectives. But unfortunately, you also get, with, with anonym anonymity, comes bad people and trolls and stupid people. And that lack of caring becomes a major disadvantage. That lack of structure, that lack of trust of people and the weak social ties means that it's very hard to get to trust people. And what you wind up suffering from is, is being lost in social space. Okay, we'll move on from there. Small experiment. There is a solution. And there's chocolate involved. I'm going to show you um, a bunch of shapes triangles, squares, and circles. And I'd like you to guess, don't tell anyone, guess how many circles there are on this screen. How many circles? Think? Got it? I'm not going to give you long, because I don't want you to count them. Um, OK, how many think there are less than 30? Three or four? How many people think there are more than 60? Ooh, quite a few. How many people think there are between 40 and 50? Oh, very large number. Between 50 and 60? Smaller number. The very large number is right. And if we were to actually average out your guesses, uh, it would come out at exactly 46, almost certainly. With a large enough audience, you would get it right. This is uh, the, the classic wisdom of the crowd experiment. Because you are so good at it, I'm going to ask my beautiful assistants here uh, to pass around candy. Um, because if we're going to be face to face, we might as well give people stuff. I like giving people stuff. It's a reward, you see. <laughs> so, yeah, the answer is that I think there were, uh, uh, yeah, 46 circles. The thing is, crowds can be smart if you put them together in the right ways. And we're using this in many different ways on the internet um, in particular, because what's happening here is that um, people are doing something. There's some activity that people are doing. We are aggregating it using some algorithm, some, some set of rules. Uh, the set of rules there was I'm just counting the average. But we can do that in way more sophisticated ways on the web. Tag clouds are a great example. Tag clouds uh, let you find out what people are interested in. And you get bigger or smaller words in the tag cloud based upon the number of people that have used those tags. 
Uh, Amazon, when it ma it's making recommendations using collaborative filtering, is using large-scale mining of people's behaviors, matching them together, looking for people like you, and recommending stuff that is often very useful. Google, Google's page rank algorithm, is based upon number of links into a page, but those in turn are weighted by the links into them, which means that you're getting a recommendation not from Google, but from the crowd, from people. I will uh, zoom through. That's the actual algorithm for those that care. Wikipedia is, uh, th there's a whole bunch of little algorithms working here, and some of them are in, our, in people's heads, some of them are in the machines. Some, some of them are saying things like, what's, what's hot at the moment is, is really based upon how many people are looking at pages. But it's also doing a kind of farming, it's structuring the space. It's making it uh, possible for people to work there by applying some kinds of rules. Stack Overflow, wonderful invention. You can rate answers and questions up and down. And if one of your answers is rated up, you gain karma points, and then you're able to rate things up and down. Completely self-organizing system means that the best answers to question uh, bubble to the top. It's driven entirely by crowd processes. Nobody is, nobody, no moderator, no teacher is saying, this is the best thing. It's the crowd saying, this is how it works. It has a whole range of interesting problems once people start to get to know one another. And the, uh, crowds can very quickly turn into stupid mobs. You have to get those algorithms right. And you have to have a crowd that is concerned with what it is that you want to do. So if it's about learning, the crowd really ought to be concerned with learning. The trouble with Amazon recommendations, for example, is that Amazon wants to sell you books. It doesn't necessarily want to help you learn. We've been building a, a site, Athabasca Landing, uh, 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 based on the L framework, which is basically sort of uh, every social media thing we could think of thrown together into one very large kitchen sink and bound together. We have made very deliberate use of set nets and groups. And we've done this because we want to go beyond the classroom metaphor of the learning management system. We recognize that in our university there is a, a host of learning going on. Uh, people that, being an online university, find it very hard to share things. So what we're trying to do, and have been doing for the last six years, with some success, we, we, we've got about 7,000 users now, um, is to find ways to help people to teach one another outside the classroom context, to go beyond the classroom walls, to have persistent things that are going on. It's a site that I could talk about for hours, but as I only have five minutes, I will not. What I will do is try to get to my main point, which is that we're living in a world with a large amount of distributed content, stuff provided by myriad teachers. We're living in a world where we're getting distributed support. Again, we're supported by dozens, hundreds, thousands of people out there. And we have tools that help us to make personal sense of all of this. Increasingly, our personal learning environments, the tools that we have from Evernote and Pocket to the, the aggregation tools in, in Facebook or wherever, they're helping us to build learning spaces for ourselves, to orchestrate things for ourselves. And we're now reaching the point where the one thing that universities have left and schools have left is accreditation. That's what we use when we, when we, when we don't have people locked in a classroom. We're using accreditation to reward and punish our students. We're, trying, we're asserting our power through accreditation. This is really determining a lot of our pedagogies. But it doesn't have to be that way anymore. That can be distributed to uh, things like Mozilla Open Badges um, uh, allows anyone to award a badge to anyone else and for that to be asserted with trust. The Tin Can API, this is uh, also known as X API, this is a means of recording your learning journey in a way that can be used in multiple different scenarios to prove your competence. We've got things like LinkedIn. LinkedIn has got these, these um, endorsements and, and processes like this where, the, uh, where people can say, oh yeah, well, John Dron knows about e-learning. And if 60 people say that, if 600 people say that, then there's a pretty good chance that I might. We don't need the same kind of accreditation anymore. Slowly but surely, 
that one thing that we have is being eroded. Does this mean the end of the line for, uh, for, for the teaching profession? I don't know. The problem, the problem is not this, incidentally. This is, uh, this is a lecture. And I've hated lectures for a long time. And I'm giving them. I'm giving one now. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. I don't have any problem with this lecture. You made a choice to come here to spend an hour of your time doing this. I go to lectures all the time. I go to them on the web, I go to them in real life. It's going a long time, isn't it, this one? Yeah. Um, I, you, you, I, I go to lots of, lots of lectures. The point is that nobody is telling me that I must, that I'm using the lecture as part, as, as one of those many teaching presences, one of those many different ways of teaching. Um, and I am doing that orchestration. Lectures are fine. By all means, do them. Just don't ever make anybody go to one. The problem is not the lecture. The problem is that we have created curricula, timetables, assessments, evaluation. I think we call it in, the, in this country for some reason. I don't quite understand. Um, so as soon as we start to introduce these methods, these processes, what we're doing is taking control. And in taking control, we are taking away the agency of the learners and of the students. And we're inevitably making it demotivating for, for most of them. And therefore, we have to work really hard. The art of the teacher becomes, infuse your students. Why do you have to infuse people that, that are learning something? We love to learn. It's crazy. So, summing up, I'm a part of all that I have met. That was from Ulysses, a, a Tennyson poem. Uh, we are all part of the people that we meet. And you are part of me. I am now a little part of you. We are all teachers. We don't have to be out there doing this kind of stuff formally anymore. We need to find ways to teach one another better. That's what it's all about. Oh, ah. Entirely. And it's really all about technology. It's about assembling technologies. All of these things are just simply assemblies. What we're doing is taking a bunch of stuff that's coming to us, that we're creating, that other people are creating, and we're assembling, we're orchestrating this process. And as long as the orchestration is done by the learner, the learner is gonna feel in control. If the learner can do that in a context where there's social value in doing so, where there's challenge, where there's excitement to be had from doing so, then we can rethink this whole notion of not just schools and colleges, but of pedagogy in general. Because learning technologies are just technologies that have pedagogy as part of that assembly. And that's, that's for reasons that I'm not entirely clear about where I'd like to leave it. But I would just like to say thank you, merci, and do download the book. And do join me for the conversation afterwards, because I would like to, to talk further about how we can actually reach a point where learners become the orchestrators and we don't, without destroying our schools in the process. Thank you very much.